You're listening to the Slavic Literature Pod, your shelf help guide to all things Slavic. All right, let me get my, let me get my uh, Las Vegas radio voice on. You're listening. Oh, I don't like that. Alrighty, hold on. <laughs> that was creepy. That was bad. That, that was sounds bad. like that's coming out of a van. Come near. <clears throat> Welcome to Office Hours. This is the new bonus episode for the Slavic Literature Pod, where we will address your questions, get into more general stuff that's going on in our lives, and uh, really die on some hills. I mean, get on some hills, die on some hills. I don't know. We'll see Same if this thing. is what gets Same us canceled. <laughs> yes, this is the office hours that I would get fired for hosting in real life. <laughs> right. You can have it for free in the virtual space. Yeah, yeah. Every time Matt has an outburst in here just now, he was once looking a student in the eye and keeping it in. Yeah, yeah. Many, th- many things are left unsaid, of course. <laughs> Speaking of Matt. Yes. I am Matt Garasimovich, one co-host, one half co-host of... The Slavic Literature Pod. That's right. Just like Cat Dog, uh, uh-huh. we got half, mm-hmm. and then the other half facing the other way. Hi, mm-hmm. I'm Cameron. Cameron Lalana. Good to meet you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> and each episode of Office Hours is sponsored by a listener in one way or another. And if you sponsor us at a certain level, which you can find on our website, SlavicLitPod.com, uh, you can choose the drinks that we are drinking on Office Hours. And this episode's drink is an espresso martini suggested to us by our dear friend, a multiple time uh, uh, a guest on the show, and podcast supporter, Caitlin. Uh, if you are interested in helping us keep our show running and want to pitch us a drink for future episodes, take a look at the tiers on our website. Like I said, slaviclitpod.com. Glad we've got the espresso martini today. It's early on my end, it's uh, Thursday. It's a day off of work. I'm not drinking before work. Nothing like an espresso martini at 1 p.m. on a Thursday for me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, see, me, you know, it's like sexy morning drinking. You, that's no, problematic afternoon drinking. Yeah, I think you can get away with like a little bit in the morning, like, oh, this is a fun kind of day, or a, a little early in the afternoon, like, oh, this is a, a kind of end of my day, but I'm at the point where I'm in between both and should not be drinking. <laughs> yeah, afternoon <laughs> drinking is only if you're doing a continuation of morning drinking. Um, mm-hmm. but I have already had Which three I'm cups not, of coffee to today, so we're going to see. Which you're not. Yes, that's true. We're going to see how the espresso martini interacts. Those are the three cups of coffee. Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start off with, with some personal stuff. Matt, let's enter the hobby hole. Please take me deep into this hobby hole, Cameron. Where are we going? <laughs> You'll be noticed we've got more branded segments now. So if you'd like to sponsor a segment, if you are perhaps, uh, I don't know, IGM or maybe Coca-Cola, Oh, you were so far off. I think we got to go Hobby Lobby. Go Hobby. <laughs> <laughs> Hobby Lobby, please. We can do better PR for you than ISIS can. Um, <laughs> sponsor us. <laughs> but now that we've entered the hobby hole, uh, Mac, mm-hmm. what have you been getting up to recently? What, what, what hole are you in in terms of hobbies? Uh, I got a few hobbies brewing down, down in my hobby hole. Uh, <laughs> Sponsored by Hobby Lobby. Sponsored by Hobby Lobby. Yeah. <laughs> First one, getting swole, slowly but surely. Hell yeah, brother. It's happening. Hell yeah. Yep, it's happening. We've been trying to, we want to change our podcast art to that old meme of like the two, I I think it's from Predator, the two guys like shaking hands, (laughs) but like to show off their muscles. That's what we're we're trying to do do here. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be the new podcast art eventually. (laughs) We paid too much money for our current one. It's too good. There's, you know, we got to switch it out. Yeah, we got to bring it, go back to roots. Back to our roots, yeah. Of doing things for free. (laughs) But yeah, so, you know, taking fitness a little more seriously over the summer while I have some time. It's been good. It's been good. Never has my body eaten so much protein. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Matt's been sure, eating sure. crazy amounts of protein. I've been, I've been witness to this. Yeah. Yeah. We have, uh, me and Cameron have matching protein powder. <laughs> we do. Well, we got to, we got to matching everything, <laughs> matching gear, matching protein powder. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so that's been good. I know. I need to get back. I, I, I fell off working out in the last couple of weeks I need to get back into it so we can be the swole brothers again so i can keep sending you photos at uh 11 30 p.m my time and like one in the morning your time of me just in my office perfect time. Perfect time. <laughs> um so okay work it out that's a good one that's important uh, have you are you doing yep. any other hobbies that are maybe detrimental to your health instead <laughs> detrimental yes i always have at least one at a time that's detrimental to my health right now well, I was going to say I've been no-lifing Diablo 4, but that's not really true. I've been sure. playing Diablo 4, but I've been so busy that I have not been no-lifing it. Right. 
I get like maybe like one day every 10 days at the moment where I don't have anything at all to do. And then like, okay, nobody talked to me. I'm just playing Diablo today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's important. That's an important one. Yeah. So that's pretty fun. And uh, yeah, I, I was in this moment where I was trying to get my life together. I was just thinking, you know, what would be great is if I started keeping a journal again, that would be helpful because it went really well for me last time. I have like seven journals that each have about three pages filled up in them. <laughs> right. So, you know, I go on and buy myself a nice journal, get into that hashtag Bujo life what? for about a week and a half. Yeah, I got to I got to understand what this note. What the fuck is a Bujo life? You don't know what a you don't know what a bullet journal is? Oh, that's what that means. Uh, well, I know what a bullet <laughs> journal is. On Instagram in, in the Bujo community. That's uh, <laughs> I what hate people that. Call it. I hate that. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. I, I, I wrote it ironically. <laughs> um, but of course, like all things that start with great irony, they become permanent fixtures in my speech. Yeah, yeah. So that's unfortunate. This inspires the same flight or, uh, fight or flight response uh, as every time you say traitors when you say Trader Joe, when you mean Trader Joe's. Uh, would TJ's be better? <laughs> TJ's is acceptable, yeah. Okay, okay. It's a little more, a little more informal. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't call Trader Joe by his full name. <laughs> right, that would be impolite. <laughs> Just hearing someone say Trader sounds like someone calling San Francisco Frisco. Frisco? Um, I'll, I could start doing that, too. No, I don't. <laughs> I'd rather you didn't. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to stand up for San Francisco on any front, but I will stand up for it, and the, specifically the front of not calling it Frisco. Um, how about San Fran? San Fran's fine. I think that's more of an equivalent to Traders. <laughs> what? That's all right. We'll get into this later. That's this is going to be a later (laughs) argument. (laughs) Um, so yeah, that's that's my hobby hole getting swole Diablo 4 Bujo life. Hell yeah, brother. What have you got brewing? Uh, I have well, for my no lifing it, I my girlfriend just got me a Meta Quest 2 as an early birthday gift, so I've given up on most of my earthly aspirations, uh, in Mm -hmm. light of being able to pop that little buddy on and play some rhythm games. Any other, um, any other games that might be concerning any other oh i think i don't i think it's sword and sorcery which is like a sword game you know which sounds like all right that's normal Uh, you can like grab someone by the neck and then stab them in the stomach and it's a little weird how like good they program that to be you can sweep people off their feet Mm -hmm. their axe it's fun but it's like you take a step back and you think if anyone saw me doing this i feel like they'd be concerned and rightfully so I'm, not, I'm like looking at this it actually looks pretty fun no it's great the other day i was fighting knights and i did not know how to get through their armor so what i did is i grabbed a knight by the neck and i used him to punch the other knights and that worked. turned to be a surprisingly <laughs> effective strategy up until the point when i had a knight in either hand grabbed by the neck punching like knights approaching me and then that was apparently such a strand in the system that the meta quest 2 almost um uh shut down <laughs> it really began chugging all those souls like games finally paying off yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah uh yeah. so i'm doing that for for unspecified reasons maybe we'll talk about them later i'm finally picking up officially russian again which we've been using kind of in the background for the podcast but as opposed to your unofficial russian. right yeah <laughs> so I've got, I've got a tutor and uh I'm getting back deeply into the bibliography of Vasily Grossman, uh, which has been which has been fun. I in, always enjoy my time with Mr. Grossman, <laughs> John J. Grossman, <laughs> my my dear personal friend, uh, V. Grossman. I think you guys probably would have been friends. <laughs> Honestly, I, I think Grossman was friends with everyone he ever met to a certain degree. He maybe didn't talk to them ever again. Kind of like you, though. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's fair. That's a valid point. Uh, before we get too into to analyzing my psychology, what what else are you doing this month, Matt? Uh, yeah, so my, it's not exactly the bane of my existence, but <laughs> boy, is it taking a lot of time sure. this summer. I, I'm involved in this project that's like a translation type, editorial type project that I'm uh, working on, making this book come to fruition that I'll not really get, I'm not going to give that much info about it because it's, it, it doesn't matter too much, but it's an art history book. It's super interesting, but Oh my gosh, it's taking a lot of time tracking down things, double checking translations, th- things of that nature. I'm getting real deep into my library's resources right. to uh, <laughs> access everything I need. Yeah, I would bet. And so this is this is why I'm working like ten day stints, like full days, more than full days. And then I you know, one day like where I have nobody asking me for anything, and then I'm <laughs> I'm like, all right, Diablo Four, here we come. <laughs> um, right. And yeah, so it's it's I have learned so much doing this it's been really good but it is boy a lot of summer work right yeah, yeah. I, th- I thought i was gonna be playing diablo this summer but that's 
Not true. Not true. Not true. I'm doing I'm doing art history <laughs> boy things. Hey, that sounds like a good summer. Which is uh, equally difficult not being an art historian myself. Sure. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you're learning new skill sets. I really am. Yeah. <laughs> so that's fun. That's fair. That's you, fair. You, you got any other big news this month? Uh, well, my girlfriend's moving in. Uh, so we are... She lives in the same, or lived, I guess, in the same complex as me. So we're just like slowly moving it over the course of the time that we have. Uh, so it's lots of time do- taking, going to the thrift store to donate stuff from either end to make room in, in this relatively small environment. So I'm getting really familiar with all the donation spots in town because of the limitations that each one has for how many bags we can give them of uh, of stuff. Um, are you going to get her a MetaQuest 2 as well? Uh, we're going to see, I'm trying to get her to use this one more. And if, uh, if it does not make her intensely motion sick, then yeah, pretty good mm-hmm. odds, pretty good odds. So then I can make her compete against me in the, the rhythm games. I feel, well, I feel like you could also duel. That's true. Well, that's, that's what, once you get your headset, then we can right. duel. <laughs> then we can duel. <laughs> <laughs> I am notoriously bad at any and all PVP base games. Sure. <laughs> I think we should get into this uh, the, the sword combat game that I've been talking about because I think it'd be very funny for both of us to be bad at swinging swords and trying to kill each other. Yeah, it would be good. <laughs> I kind of, I, I'm kind of into it though. Like, I don't know. No, I think maybe that's our next podcast. <laughs> <laughs> our next podcast is uh, medieval European combat from two guys who know nothing about it but are determined to learn by killing each other. I would listen to that. I mean, the way you described it sounds pretty good. That would be, you know, if we ever need to pivot, dear listener, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do day zero learning medieval forms of combat uh and that's just come our channel like week to week our progress until we become you know uh, i'd say killing machines but i feel like that's not really a medieval thing i feel like it's kind of like a more like a poking holes in someone and then they die of sepsis machine really is what you did <laughs> <laughs> we are sepsis machines. <laughs> um but speaking of questions of of um great import mm-hmm. we get some we got a listener question that's a big one yeah uh, and we got a few yeah and you got you got some thoughts and i so let me yeah. let me pose this to you uh from i think this this is comes from our this comes from our discord do you have maddeningly gerasimovich a literary mm-hmm. hill that you will die on or maybe just a hill that you'll die on yeah i got a few all right i, I think actually most most of my opinion is i'd probably die on because i'm just really stubborn sure sure uh in general but i was going through the old bookstagram the other day as i was <laughs> as you, you know i gotta give the preface as i told you um yeah and i was scrolling through i don't remember what but it was some some instagram reel on war and peace and i don't really remember what it was it doesn't matter there was some argument going on in the comments because of course there was it was like a really po- it was like an extremely popular video for war and peace which is uh, we don't get so many of them right right and in our in our corner of the world so it drew in a lot of people who aren't familiar with russian literature and there was this argument going on about literary fiction and somebody was kind of saying or actually maybe it wasn't even war and peace i don't even know <laughs> maybe it was a real about literary fiction either way i'm going to make my point um somebody was arguing about <laughs> why why we need like the preface literary because everything is just kind of fiction if you think about it and there they said or somebody replied and said kind of explaining why why it might be necessary what it sort of denotes and they said well you wouldn't put like uh, a lot of ya works in the same category as war and peace for instance and the person wrote back and i was like watching this and i was like yeah they wouldn't do that would they and then they wrote back, and they're like, "I absolutely would put them in the same category." And I was like, "Ooh!" <laughs> uh, and I almost, I almost combusted. <laughs> We've encountered someone too powerful to talk to. Yeah, so I don't know where that le- left me. And actually, I'm pretty sure it was a real about literary fiction, and that was why seeing War and Peace struck me as like that's what I think that's what drew me in. I was like, "Ooh, right." discourse <laughs> is that how and that's the other day i for context sent me this list i think it's time like top 100 ya reads for the year is, is that where this article came from or is that a different no thing that was different okay. that was just my research Got because it. i wanted to talk about ya and my dislike for it right and i want i wanted to see what like what do people consider ya that's what i wanted to see 
and this was by time whoever wrote this should be fired <laughs> uh number 13 on their list well first of all the list didn't include anything that i don't think was even really considered ya it was just books by or vaguely relating to teenagers i think mostly consumed by teenagers maybe was the what i could not tell the it's yeah so i i guess it wasn't it wasn't numbered but uh pretty high on the list was anne frank the diary of a young girl which i was like really (laughs) which sorry as we're doing this i'm scrolling back so i'm like who 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 published this on time yeah how we made this list oh it was convenient oh it was a panel okay all right Oh, oh, so you should all be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so when I saw that on there, and I think I, I think what their what their methodology here was books that are mostly read by teenagers, and I think it's true that this di- the diary of Anne Frank is mostly read by teenagers, probably in school. Sure. Uh, uh, however, I don't know if that makes it YA, but also that gets into discussion of what YA is, which is an entirely different thing. But that to me that had and I mentioned this to Matt, that I had the exact same gut reaction as the time that i think indie wire had a panel of people put together the best uh movie sex scenes of the 2010s and they included midsummer on the list and if you're not <laughs> familiar the only sex scene in midsummer is a very is a cult rape scene so whoever put that one on there should be a, on a watch list much like perhaps whoever yeah. chose this book yeah no not yeah yeah so so i didn't i didn't i didn't like this list um, not that the books on there like shouldn't be read is not what I'm saying. Just the, uh, I, I was like, have any of you ever heard of a YA? Because I'd, I'd love to know. <laughs> I really would. Right. I mean, they get to the problem as we discussed YA is, and maybe someone has put together a more informed take on this. And I, I would invite anyone to send this to this. Send, People definitely have. Yeah. If you, if you know good ones, send it to us. But why is just like, it's a marketing term, which makes, which is why these lists are so incoherent. Because when I'm thinking YA, you know, I'm thinking the YA of when I was a teenager, which are. A lot of books that have been forgotten, and then The Hunger Games, or I don't know, um, Divergent, or whatever. Like books that are written exclusively for the consumption, for to be consumed by teenagers. But yeah, but Divergent was written, wasn't it? Didn't it take place in that very exotic, like war-torn dystopian land that we know as Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was very unique in the way that yeah, it portrayed. Chicago as a war-torn dystopia, <laughs> and then every young person could be divided divided into one of four houses, which you know were based on their main character trait, which was a you know pretty unique, I think, integration yes. of the plot there. Um, yes, <laughs> they were really just missing some sort of object that would perhaps filter them into those such houses. Yeah, that would have been that would have been helpful. I think. Yeah, I think so too. I don't know. I only read like the first book <laughs> i've never read a single divergent book so you're <laughs> i've actually never i've never read a book um, <laughs> yeah, at all. yeah is, this, is this a bad time to admit that that we're both eight? Is it, yeah <laughs> i just like to um dislike things that other people like <laughs> <laughs> that was the entire impetus for this podcast <laughs> <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> yeah but i think we came to the conclusion that um that we don't buy into ya <clears throat> right I mean, there are YA Sorry. books I liked when I was a teenager, but, and this is my honest, honest to God belief, I think the, na- the American national security apparatus is like a very bad thing <laughs> on the whole. Uh, but if we uh-huh. did turn the NSA towards making sure that adults like didn't watch more than two children's cartoon series a month, I, I don't think I'd be mm-hmm. against that. I think that'd be a good use of their time. And YA you think should also be on, on the watch list? I think you get a higher limit. I think you get like three to four. It doesn't count if it's a reread. I'm, I'm willing to be a little flexible on that one, but there should be an upper limit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I was like scrolling through the list, and I was just like, I don't know, like I was scrolling through list of things that could be considered YA, and I was like, some some people put on like The Giver, and I was like, okay, sure, I don't know, I read it in eighth grade, so <laughs> what am I going to say about it now? <laughs> right. Um, you know, everybody of course cites Harry Potter. Uh, sure, I don't know. Well, yeah, the, the the problem with the list, getting back to the thing that's a marketing term, is there's lots of books in there which were not intended for teenagers, but are mostly consumed by teenagers because they're a very popular part of right. school curriculums. Um, whatever, like The Great Gatsby, mm-hmm. uh, Catcher in the Rye, you know, similar books. Like a lot of those books are not intended for teenagers. It's just that mostly teenagers consume them, which is, I think, different from books like targeted at teenagers, which, you know, the problem of it being a marketing term and not a real description of actual anything actually in the genre which is like there's this i think there was this discourse somewhere in social media about 
cozy horror and what that is. And I'm not going to get into that, but my, my, my big takeaway from cozy horror was that it was, uh, it was just an incoherent concept because it didn't describe anything. And I think at the very minimum, if you're going to have, I'm not against the idea of cozy horror, but if you're going to have a, a theme, like a subsect of any piece of work, whether that be movies, books, whatever, it should be a relatively easy to understand definition, which is consistent. And if it, whatever it is changes, depending on who you talk to and what industry you're in, that might be not a really good term to use. And the, yeah, so I agree with this, but I also think, I think two things. One, I think most genre is pretty fluid, but I think that you need to have an understanding of genre before you can really understand how the fluidity works. Right. Which does sound pretentious. I understand. But I get it. It's like understanding that (laughs) if you're like a big metalhead, understanding that Pantera is groove metal and what groove metal is in relation to thrash metal, you know, it's a little bit fluid, mostly related to the tempo, but you have to understand what each of those things are to understand them in relation to each other. Yeah. Um, I I think that a a a lot of the books that I sometimes see on lists that are cited as YA, it so stretches the boundary of what it what it could be considered into encompassing things from other genres Mm. and i don't know it just bothers me that's all i don't really have a well articulated reason why but it just kind of bothers me that's fair that's all that's valid i think it does show like a lack of i don't know it would just be good if like people cared about reading literature and like uh understanding a little bit about it the construction of it and so on Um, the devices that you know you know like literary studies as such like the devices that actually make genre things like that right Uh, i think would go i think would go a long way (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah i mean i don't know if everyone needs to be like a specialist or understand that but i i think we should be more discerning or challenge yourselves a little more (laughs) in general yeah and also on the question of do we need a category that denotes something literary i would say yes Because uh, it makes me feel better uh, than other people. And so I kind of need that to like distinguish amongst, you know, the other really is is what I want is really is really what I want. Right. No, no, that's important. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't I guess you don't really need you you don't need it. But I I think it's like kind of like a helpful critical tool in some ways. Uh, I think to me, the, the category of literary gets into the question of like, what is art in a lot of ways? And to denote something as literary means like it has succeeded within its form and thus will hopefully, you know, st- stand the test of time and has contributed something to its genre or to, again, its form uh, in a way that other works like do not. And it doesn't mean that you can't read those and you can't like those. Like, I really don't care. Um, <laughs> it's fine. Right. But it, th- there should be some, right, there should be some distinction, some sort of categorization, I think. On that basis. And that's why War and Peace is not uh, Divergent, for example. <laughs> I mean, they're both fiction, sure. But what But, but what if uh, But what if uh, our good friend Bezukhov uh, was the mm. Divergent? He's in all four houses at once. That's why he, <gasps> that's why he uh, philosophically destroys Napoleon by the end of the book. Divergents really are kind of the Tolstoyan seekers, if you think about <laughs> it. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah i can't remember what else i had to say in this except that it, it bothers me every time i go online <laughs> sure sure i think you're just bothered when you go online really yeah that's part of it that is part of it but i think like part of it too for me is since this is now what i've been like what i've been studying it's sort of the the on, on social media just everyone everyone's a critic basically sure yeah and so it kind of like denigrates what i spend time doing when just any schmuck can be like, okay, I will start a Russian literature quotes page <laughs> and I will post out of context quotes that completely misguide my audience irresponsibly into thinking that somebody said something that wasn't really the case. Yeah. I can think of any number of them on Instagram. Instagram is far worse, actually, than other platforms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. I, I, I think I mentioned this in our Discord the other day, but I was looking up, I was trying to find a copy of... Um, uh, Vasily Grossman's article Ukraine Without Jews um, and I ended up finding some reviews of his books and then some I found, I found a review which heavily criticized Stalingrad as being like basically she called uh, this author or this uh, writer called uh, Vasily Grossman a coward for writing Stalingrad and then it's like yeah but it, later on he became brave when he wrote Life and Fate and I was like alright 
Mm. I understand where you're coming from, and I understand the moral failings you're talking about. I, I am, I, and you don't have to be a specialist to do this, and I'm not a specialist, but I feel like this is a not a good categorization just to say, all right, when when is our are authors brave and write good books, and when are authors cowards and write, or you know, vice versa, when are they cowards and write bad books or brave and write good books in the Soviet context? Uh, that's its own thing. That person did have a PhD or was training to have a PhD, and that is an example of of um, maybe everyone should be critics because I mean, this is things people with degrees that study things sometimes have god awful takes yeah i mean it wasn't an uninformed take i just i just i disagree with the idea that you can reduce an author down to like cowardice or bravery especially in the face of you know a soviet system where like oh why didn't he write life and fate earlier i don't why didn't he write life and fate in the middle of world war ii when he was like on the front lines with the right know, army I, as they're liberating that. berdachev yeah. and he's finding out what the nazis did to his family I don't know why he might have had a brighter view of the Red Army at that time than later in life when he talked to people coming out of the camps. That's a real mystery to me. <laughs> right, right. I know that was not that was not a very good article. I'm a little surprised that it got published. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my hills I'll die. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to link to it um, because I, no, it doesn't really it doesn't really matter. I mean, plenty of pe- it's it's also not just one person's take. Plenty of people feel that way about Grossman. Right. I think yeah. I think um, Robert Chandler in one of his intros mentioned that that's like a very common understanding. Which blows my mind as uh, as like an understanding you could have that an author who, when his wife was arrested by Yeshov in the middle of the Great Terror, wrote directly to him and be like, hey, can you let my wife go? And also, I've adopted her kids, so you can't send them to the orphanage. To accuse him of moral failing uh, rather than acknowledge that the Soviet system compromised a lot of people. Um, and you could have someone who's incredibly brave in many ways also do many coward- cowardly acts. And instead of saying that that's part of the future of life where we in our own lives do a lot of brave and cowardly things sometimes on a daily basis uh under much less stressful circumstances than grossman was in oh yeah um it just feels yeah bizarrely abstracted from any sort of reality also that is kind of what the book is about is about how the how the two can coexist which uh, again would (laughs) in some ways constitute some sort of misreading of the of the book that is being valorized in order to make a point that's based on your contemporary you know set of morals no, that, that's true especially because this author then also takes that exact quote of like if you've never been in this cir- circumstance you can't understand how little power you feel and then immediately follows it up with and is like yeah too bad he didn't overcome that <laughs> like it's incredibly brave yeah. for you to write that from you know whatever wherever this person was from to look back at like a soviet jew in the 1950s who is under stalin's personal gaze <laughs> like not being yeah. more uh anti-soviet that is an astounding demand to make like someone who would have probably been executed were it not for stalin's timely death yeah, you probably that's yeah yeah but that's the grossman cast for you <laughs> that's the grossman cast um i can't wait to read more gross though God, I, on the podcast i've been i've been getting back into reading them it's been so much it's been a good time i've been thinking a lot about we talked a little bit about I, i'll save this for later but motherhood in relation to the <laughs> books and now that i've been reading more uh, of his earlier work i'm really fascinated by his evolving the, the way he portrays mother because it's a really big theme for him throughout all of his works from like his very first published work has to do with a commissar giving birth and such a fascinating relationship from that to later works on motherhood but if you contrast it too with like some of the earlier if you'd consider the socialist realism, like if you contrast it to like cement, which is all about babies dying right. essentially <laughs> and mothers doing nothing. To, well, not only doing nothing to help, there is nothing they can do to help. There's everyone's starving. Uh, not a good time in general. There's just dead babies floating in the right. water. Like it's, you know, uh, it's a little more optimistic. Yeah. Well, it's also kind of funny. You can kind of see some of them. Um, I, I don't know, gender dynamics of <laughs> Soviet realism related to motherhood. We've got like Alexandra mm-hmm. Kollontai being like, we need to revolutionize how, how how we raise children to make motherhood less of an individual sacrifice and more of a community effort to, you know, Gladkov, which is like, yeah, the children are dead. We can't help them. This is a lost generation. <laughs> to like Grossman, who early works as like, motherhood and parenting is important, but it's not as important as the revolution to later Grossman, which is like, having children is the future of our Soviet state and all that. It's, you know, interesting dynamics here. Yeah. What are you going to do? But anyway, that's enough of the Grossman cast. Um, and to the end of the hills, you want to talk about dying on? That was my main one, which is, uh, I don't personally like YA that much. I don't think it's a good descripting 
the good good descriptor of a genre. I think it's a marketing term. Uh, if you decide to read it, I really don't care. You should enjoy it. Uh, it's great that it brings some people into reading. I do think, though, that it traps a group of people who then lose interest in reading once they can no longer to relate and relate to it and then are like, what do I read now as an adult? Well, literary fiction. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's that's my hill. Um more on the terminology than the whether you like it because i ultimately don't really care right yeah that's fair like you know enjoy your reading it's great that you read anything to be <laughs> honest compared to most people who don't so yeah yeah that is true uh, so so now that we spent 20 minutes on my hill <laughs> do, do you have any hills you, you got a hill to die on i do now that you've had this whole thing about how people should read more i've got a point that people should le- read less uh mm-hmm. which is that and so this is related to something we're going to be doing on our Discord coming up, or maybe just past, depending on what time we end up doing that in relation to when this podcast yeah. comes out. Um, 1984. We put it in a bonus episode a long time ago. Love it. <laughs> Great book. I will link this, my, my, that episode in the show notes. My thoughts on 1984 then to now are much the same, but I'm going to expand that point, which is that 1984, Animal Farm, and Brave New World, are, are we need to stop assigning them to like high schoolers or if we do assign them in context because at least this is my experience 1984 animal farm brave new world were all assigned to me and they were assigned as political education they were assigned as part of my government class so government. <laughs> and that was one of the main ways we learned about government was from these these systems in each of these books and which were put up as like oh yeah there's america and then there's these worlds 1984 brave new world which is amazingly cold world or cold world amazingly cold war to be like yeah either you gotta have american democracy or you've got 1984 uh which in the 1980s yeah that was a relatively normal thing to teach kids however to maintain that now is is astounding and also it it it, it does not teach people if you want to use a book i know i said this before if you want to use a book to teach people to engage with their system critically you should first teach them to engage in critically with the government they live under and then in relation to that you can meaningfully look at other governments because if you don't really understand the system you live under then you can't meaningfully kind of criticize other people's systems of governance so if you're going to need read 1984 you should read some books critical of the american context in which i would put forth it can happen here by sinclair lewis uh, which is a depiction of how fascism could come to america and i would posit as a much better book than frankly all of these combined and i don't say that because i don't like those authors i think brave new world is a very good book I think uh, George Orwell is a very good author. I think 1984 Animal Farm are some of his lesser works, but that's neither here nor there. Um, it just it feels so Cold War and so out of date to teach these as political education in absence of real political education and in the absence of novels which actually address it in the, in the American context. It's wild to me, but of course, uh, American education systems being lacking is probably not the most incisive argument to make. Um, you heard it here first. <laughs> right. No one said it before. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I feel defeated in that fact because I know no one's ever going to listen to me, but um, because we, yeah, what, yeah, when I was like in, in middle school, I heard people complaining about learning about slavery as being like, oh, this is too negative. Why do we have to learn about slavery? So the idea you have to add, <laughs> if if some of the attitudes I I I saw growing up with was learning about America's actual history is already too negative, um, having actual criticism of the American government is uh, probably tantamount to treason to some people. So I don't think it's actually feasible, but but I think it is important because, sorry, I'm going to continue. I was, I was about to lead off, but hear me out. No, that's good. So family lore, as a side point, um, sorry if any of my family listen to this. I don't trust any of my family lore. <laughs> and mm-hmm. the reason why is because I'm, I am fairly confident that all family lore, every generation it gets passed down through, it gets reinterpreted through the generation that is telling it, and it gets reinterpreted through their point of view. And I say this because on my mom's side, uh, my mother is half Czech. And so there was a story I was told as a child of how, and my mother grew up during the Cold War, um, how uh, the Soviets took everything that the family had in Czechoslovakia, which, first of all, doesn't hold up on a number of fronts. But let me walk you through some things. Um, it, you might think, but the, Czech, uh, the Czechoslovakia was not part of the Soviet Union. Maybe it was the Czechoslovakian government. Um, possibly, except for the, the little thing where um, my, my mother's family came to the U.S. in 1916 
And the family claims that that happened to the great-grandfather of the person who came to the U.S. in 1916. So that would have placed that roughly in, like, the 1860s, which, if you know anything about the Soviet Union, does have some problems for the Soviets seizing your property in um, 1860, uh, namely Mm -hmm. that they aren't going to exist for another 60 years. So that would put them squarely in, in, I think it was Pilsen, that side of the family comes from, that would have put them squarely in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So realistically, it was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, possibly the Catholic Church, who, if that is indeed a true story, took all their stuff. Uh, what I mean that to say is that, so what was prob- maybe a true story of, you know, the church or the state seizing their horses or whatever, then got reinterpreted to future generations as like every con- contemporary enemy they grew up with. That's why I don't really trust any family stories, and that's why I think 1984 and Animal 4 and Brave New World are not very helpful because they are set in the times that they come from, which is not a very incisive statement, but teaching them now also has that same issue where we relitigate uh, political problems which haven't existed for you know, 30, 40 years at this point, and, and our act and believe that to be a contemporary and coherent and meaningful political education on top of everything else we've talked about yeah but if you think about it they're kind of not really even fiction because they're so that's true, true. <laughs> right that that is to true quote a very wise senator's uh summation of one of these i can't remember right which. uh it's all well i mean it, i guess it is very true in the sense that o'brien in 1984 might be read as you know as this sort of radical who's actually an agent of the government might be a good metaphor for george orwell himself who spent the latter part of his life informing on you know informing on um leftist parties to the british government so (laughs) george orwell is o'brien essentially writing these books for some of these groups and then informing on them to the government uh i think we should read them and i think that you should just morph it to fit kind of whatever you feel like (laughs) that's right um because that's easy that's easy and I think that's a good way for people to engage with literature, which is only on their own terms. Yes. Which kind of incidentally brings me to our next segment, Matt V. Reddit. I'm so excited. For I've been waiting for months for this. <laughs> I didn't prep that well for it. Uh, <laughs> but they, it, each of these shows what I think is the best of r slash Tolstoy and r slash Russian literature which really steamed my goose like you would not believe. (laughs) Uh, I I created a a group or whatever it's called on Reddit so I can look at them all at once. And it's horrible. I I, I used to think, oh, I can go on there and I can post meaningful things and then people will find our podcast and that'll be good. But uh, no, Uh, sometimes I post meaningful things and (laughs) and then nobody looks at them uh, (laughs) and they all engage with the dumb answer instead that somebody else left. No offense. I am so sorry. Can I, one of these, I love this so much. Can I read mm-hmm. both the title of this post and the, the content of this post about Western e- names? Yes. You can. <laughs> okay. This is, this is from r slash no stupid questions. Uh, the title of the post is, are there versions of the books like Crime and Punishment with Western names? Post body. Like, why can't they make a version where Rodion Raskolnikov is Richard Rogers or something? That would be so much easier to remember and I wouldn't have to look up who is who every other chapter. Yes. Uh, <laughs> great question. Thank you. Uh, every single one of these I'm not convinced is real. I think it could be a, a sleeper agent for r slash book circle jerk. Sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure. This uh, really made me laugh like you would not believe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it very likely could be a plant, but God, I, w- I, would, uh, I would not be surprised to encounter that honestly in the wild. No, I, I wouldn't be surprised based on based on anything. Well, because I, I really think the wouldn't. core of the issue is that there's a true there's a true problem there, which is that people who are not familiar with Slavic naming conventions or Slavic names are going to have a harder time remembering names they're not familiar with. Rodion Raskolnikov is not the easiest name if you are not familiar with Slavic names otherwise. Um, <laughs> that being yes. said, demanding literature then evolve around you rather than working on yourself to grow and adapt to that, that's when, well... Yeah, that's when it starts to become a little uh, problematic. I, I like the idea that like classic literature should be changed just to be easier for you. <laughs> I mean, I'm not against, you know, making these works more accessible or like, like rewriting I Shakespeare am. or whatever. I think that's no. a fun, fine way. Make it harder. <laughs> <laughs> Publish it only in pre-reform Russian. <laughs> <laughs> 
but just Richard Rogers. I honestly, I couldn't take it seriously if, it, if this was a if Raskolnikov is called Richard Rogers. Hi, my name is Richard Rogers, and I'm a modern Napoleon. I've met five guys like that. I can't take that seriously. Yeah, well, he was uh, Mr. Rogers' bad uh, brother. <laughs> <laughs> right. You don't hear about him much after the uh, landlord incident. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, there wasn't there wasn't a lot of on that post, but um, no, most most people were like, "What?" Like, <laughs> <laughs> even on the subreddits, which normally like they do garner some decent engagement, even people on this one were like, <laughs> "What?" <laughs> Uh, that's a good one, but uh, let's go from there to the first one list, which I think is the funniest one mm-hmm. and a good pitch for our own podcast. But I'll, I'll throw that one over to you. <laughs> I believe this was r slash Tolstoy. Best way to experience War and Peace without reading it. <laughs> that was the question. Uh, they did go on to to preface that they had ADHD and have a hard time reading in general. And War and Peace is like a thousand pages, and also it's expensive. So that brings us to Cameron. Best way to experience War and Peace without reading it. Good suggestions included, I don't know, an audiobook. Sure. Uh, read a summary before or after to make sure you understood. That's fine. Uh, worse suggestions included uh, watching Bondarchuk's uh, eight-hour variant film <laughs> of War and Peace. I wouldn't recommend that as a substitute. Best option, listen to our podcast on War and Peace. Absolutely do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, also, the mo- I don't know. This, maybe it's just me, but... I feel like watching movies is way harder than reading a book just to pay attention to it, but that might just be me. But <laughs> for eight hours, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I also like the person in the in the, um, in the comments who's trying to be supportive, but the, they have the bizarrest way of going about it, which is there are three hundred sixty one chapters. The chapters are short. The longest is eleven pages. The average length is three point four t- pages, which is fair. That's that's a fair point. However, I don't think saying there are only three hundred sixty one chapters is really an inducement to reading it more than anything else. <laughs> I actually do think Tolstoy is pretty easy to read. I'll be honest, and a lot of it is actually this reason, which is the chapters just aren't that long. No, this is true. So you really, I mean, and you don't have to read that much each day if you don't want to. Yeah. I think it's good advice. I just think leading with there are 361 chapters is not the best way to lead that. Lead it with the chapters are short, not that there are hundreds of them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I wouldn't. Right. I wouldn't I wouldn't lead with that. But so my, my issue with these two, this is why. Wait, I hold on. Really Sorry, I just realized okay. that someone in this in this comment section recommended that they listen to our podcast. That's funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. That Well, I mean, we're kind of like a big deal. Uh, yeah, that's actually, I mean, we're so not even on Reddit. People, every time someone mentions us, people are like, "Whoa, I haven't heard of this." <laughs> hey, it's been three years. What are you gonna do? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Go on. My problem with this and kind of on like a bookstagram in general, which is like where they or people who don't read a lot often encounter issues with uh, first of all classics, second of all Russian literature of this specific time period. Which, I mean, really, we only read, like, the classics and masterpieces of this time because the pulp stuff just (laughs) get translated. It was just whatever, you know. It existed, but it's not, you know, it's not the stuff that people read from this time period. But this issue is people want reading to be entertainment, but it's not always entertainment. And that's what is so difficult. Sometimes reading is supposed to be hard. And sometimes it's not supposed to be that enjoyable. Sometimes it's just hard. Sometimes it's just a challenge. It can be a slog. Uh... And that is why I always kind of like, like wince just like a little bit when I, when I get on Reddit and people are just like, you know, trying to like shirk that responsibility that you have as a reader to be challenged. And they're just like, oh, can I do it easier? <laughs> right. You know, and that, that, that's what bothers me. And I think that to, to your point, that's one of the important things of well, an important reason to acknowledge that literary fiction exists, uh, because then you can that gives you the ability with this characterization to know, okay, I'm feeling like I am in a place where I can be challenged or I don't feel like that, which as a host of this podcast, all the time we're reading literary fiction, all the time in my own free time, I'm reading trash sci-fi because that's personally what I just find easy and enjoyable to read. Um, not that I don't enjoy going out of my way to go read challenging things in my own personal time. It's just, it's not for all the time. Sometimes I just want to read a trashy Warhammer 40k novel, and that's what I'm going to read because I find that to be fun, and it's its own thing. And that also helps me recover, I guess, in a way, to come back to the more challenging works and figuring out where your limits are and figuring out, uh, and not like, not, 
not being like the person at the gym who's like, I have to lift a 50 pound weight even if I can't. I mean, get your reps in. Get a reps in at a, a level you can do it, and that will get you stronger over time. And figure out what works for you. It's there's just it's just not there's not one straightforward path to doing this, which I think is why it's reasonable to acknowledge the different forms of art in books there are. Yeah, I think that's why. Like, I mean, it, of course, it can be entertaining. It is most of the time. Yeah, but War and Peace it's is also a lot of fun. Challenging. Yeah, it is, but it's also challenging. And yeah. especially people unfamiliar, like you said, with naming conventions, that is pretty difficult. Right. Um, but on a serious note on why we need to have Russian names in Russian books, uh, there, you know, you I could actually see why this person makes this argument. I wouldn't call people Richard Rogers, but the, <laughs> the naming conventions that I find are especially difficult. I think people understand patronymics and they can get the basic naming conventions pretty easily. They're not really that difficult. Just read a Wikipedia article, you'll be fine. The hard part is nicknames. When people are called nicknames, that is difficult for people. That took me a while to grasp, but the different nicknames, they mean different things. The way that people address each other, especially in high society, it's really important. And you don't need to get that on your first read, maybe. Maybe you're really just <laughs> like trying to follow the plot, and that's okay. But uh, on an actual note, that is why you need the, the names. That's the function they serve is characterization. Right. Um, and you're not going to get it by calling Richard Robert, <laughs> Richard Roberts, uh, <laughs> Richie, you know, like it's, you know, it's not the same to divorce it like from its cultural context when in that culture naming conventions mean something, uh, it, it wouldn't work. Right. And I think that that reinforces a point which you've always made in this podcast from the like literally day one, which is that if you're going to read the quote unquote big idea books, War and Peace, Crime and Punishment, whatever, it's worthwhile to start with shorter pieces, shorter pieces that are easier for you to digest, a good way to, for you to dip your toes in maybe unfamiliar naming conventions and having to deal with fewer of them rather than like That's two right. dozen. Get those dogs comfy. I mean, come on. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, as Matt has always said, it gets you comfortable with understanding the ideas the authors are expressing before they start putting them to a thousand pages. So, right, right. I mean, like, like I said before, um, if you go to the gym for the first time, don't start with the fifty pound weight. Start with the start the weights Hundreds. that are at your limit. Start with oh. <laughs> start with the fifteen ten pound weight. And start with short stories for a lot of bigger authors. Start with the hundred. Just go right in, lift two worn pieces and just put two or three in each hand. Just go. Easy. No problem. Easy. No problem. <laughs> but yeah, it's also kind of like the approach that you take to it, I think. Like I know like when I would read I don't know, my one of my old English teachers always called them popcorn books. Uh who sure <laughs> books that you can eat popcorn while reading because you don't have to underline and like make notes for yourself. Um, you can just read those like all, like all day, you pick it up, put it down. There's not really, you know, a lot of mental energy expended, but like when you're reading war and peace, I don't know, maybe some people can get really into it, but even me personally, like I, I, I hit a limit of how much I can read each day where it's like, okay, I really cannot keep <laughs> my analytical brain going. Like I need to put it down basically. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's me ending Reddit. <laughs> and just like Wittgenstein ending philosophy, Matt has ended Reddit forever. It's hard because there actually are some really knowledgeable people on there that do give good uh, feedback, but it's really hard to tell what is what. Yeah. Not all the recommendations are good. Relatedly to this naming thing, let's go from being very understanding to be a little bit less understanding to something related Finally. to language. And <laughs> let's go to our segment, which we have titled Books to Graham. Sorry. <clears throat> Bookstagram Beatdown, Beat down. which is the name that Matt has chosen, I would just like to point out. Yes. Yes. <laughs> just yes. sitting in the glory. <laughs> yes. All right. So who and or, or, and or what are we, are we beating down? What concepts are we beating down? Um, everyone. Everyone. Basically. In general. That's fair. In general. Um, let's see. I'm trying to phrase this in a way that doesn't make it seem like <laughs> I'm the only one that I think gets to comment on things. <laughs> <laughs> which is uh true but not what i wanted to, to sure. say what so there are some things that bother me when i look at russian literature slavic literature discourse one of them is the question that people always ask what translation should i read 
I do not care. Pick it up and start reading. See if you like it. Uh, if you don't like it, maybe you have a bad translation, but just start reading. Stop asking. Just look. You, people only talk about like five books that are in the Russian literature canon on Bookstagram, and this question is asked on every single one of them. And there's no definitive answer for the most part on almost any of them. So what I would recommend, just find one that seems good, you know? doesn't really it doesn't really it doesn't really matter i mean to be completely honest with you i'll I'll go out and say it there are some that are better than others um but ultimately the one that is the best is the one that's going to make you most interested in reading now that being said (laughs) the other side of the discourse is people who recommend translations without speaking russian and i don't know how you think that you are evaluating the translation boy i would really love to know um (laughs) there's a couple pages that i take exception with that discuss this idea of translation specifically with 19th century you know golden age literature of oh i think this is the best translation this and that but you know you can have your your personal opinion on which one you think reads best but um by saying this is the best translation you're inherently judging across languages which you do not have the capacity (laughs) uh, to work in which is what bothers me so so much yeah which is kind of a thing, like a small thing no one cares about to be annoyed by. Um, but, but it's a good thing to pay attention to. Yeah, it's it's not just on Bookstagram, it's everywhere, but it's especially there, I think. like the That's where you run across it. Yeah, you run across like people who are like positing themselves as figures of authority within this that like do not know what they're talking about, like flat out will like, like completely eat up the uncritical description of a narrator and be like, wow, isn't that crazy that like just everybody loves Steve. What a funny, <laughs> hey, oh, happy go lucky guy. I wish I could be like Steve. That's what war and peace is about. Or uh, that's what Anna Karenina is about. Um, and that's the stuff that just grinds my gears. Right. Or stuff where I think you, you sent this to me once where it was a post where someone was like in war and peace when the Mason is giving uh, Pierre advice and the the poster was like yeah the mason makes a good point don't you think this is like really interesting thought from tolstoy which first of all conflating characters in a book that tolstoy wrote in tolstoy already its own book of you know can of words right, right. but secondarily <laughs> citing the masons is is extreme i've only read this far in the book and i do not know what comes next for the mason storyline energy <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah they're right and you know to that point like that's kind of the wonder of Tolstoy, which is he presents a lot of different viewpoints. Uh, this is like the whole point of War and Peace, right? He presents a lot of different viewpoints that seem like they could be right, but they're not. <laughs> and y- y- like you just like lapping that up, like it, you just finish the book. Just finish <laughs> the book. That's all. That's literally all I'm asking before you go out and post about it. Unless you are just one of these people who's like, you know, I'm reading for fun. I thought this was interesting. Like, I'm not, I, I have no problem with these people. That's totally fine. Um, I, I don't care. You know, keep your reading journal, do whatever you want, engage with your community, fine. It's the people that pose as experts and authorities that have no, not even, it's not even a formal training issue. It's just you don't know enough. Mm. Which is, this is what starts to sound pretentious. Like, mm, I, I can be the judge of what you know. Um, but I would say finishing the book, that's a pretty clear and cut one you should do before you start to talk about things. Uh, that would be a good one. Yeah. I mean, if I could add on to that, I think. Yeah, you may. That. Thank you. Thank you for the information. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Is that the, you can, the consistent thread through a lot of these people, um, in their accounts is that they pose russian in specifically russian literature not any other slavic literature as a literature which is unique and has certain insights which is not offered elsewhere uh and you have to read it to really like um you know this is the only sort of literature which will really elevate your mind in one way or another and i am always suspicious and i say that as someone who's an enthusiast of slavic literature I am always suspicious of the claim that this specific canon can offer you these answers and that no other canon can, because all canons can offer you some kind of answer. They've That's what everyone in all of human history dealing with art has always been trying to do. Um, Slavic literature is not special for trying to tackle that question. It has gained a certain mythos, and if you are talking to someone, it's apparent that they buy too much into that mythos rather than engaging with it as a piece of work which is 
of its time, addressing issues of its time, but also possibly addressing issues going forward. That's uh, that's a bit of a suspect view, in my opinion. I, I mean, I think I I love War and Peace. I think everyone should read War and Peace. I also don't think you should take War and Peace too seriously. It has good ideas and it has things you consider. It's also very funny. Like, not I don't mean you should take it seriously. Like, don't take Tolstoy or his ideas seriously, but like. You know that Tolstoy was having fun in a lot of ways. Like, Pierre becoming a numerologist is funny. It's meant to be funny. Um, and it's human in that regard. Dealing with big ideas, ideas, dealing with humor, dealing with low points, high points, whatever. It is a complex literature, like all the other literatures of the world. And if you talk to someone who is of the opinion that Russian literature is some sort of special big idea thing, you've got to take it extremely seriously, and you've got to take everything on face value then I think you should be a little suspect of the ideas they're trying to convey. Not to say they're wrong, just to say that I think that could be indicative that they maybe have not been that critical in their reading. I, I don't I don't really know why it is, but I can just tell you, like, the 19th century canon, like, especially with men, it attracts a certain type of man. Right. And it is strange. <laughs> Quite strange. <laughs> Dostoevsky specifically. Right. Um, will attract a very certain type of person. It is concerning to me, mm-hmm. to say the least. <laughs> um, and it is it is often people that I'm like, did like, did you really read it? I don't know. It feel it's like people who read Crime and Punishment and kind of stopped after the first three chapters and were like, yeah, I'm basically a modern Napoleon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> Or, you know, people who go through to the re- re- to the end and, and then take that into their own interesting direction, which I'll give them credit. They did read the whole thing, and they were more creative with that interpretation. But... <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't... I, I have a hard time with that, but that is what is on Instagram, like, a lot. And it's tough. It is, yeah. I think we're going to shut down the podcast and just become, like, a Dostoevsky quotes page. <laughs> We're going to be like when you walk into like a small inn in the middle of nowhere and you see that big sign on the wall that comes from abstract art that says art will save the world, Dostoevsky. Um, we're going to be like that. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, just be, I mean, even towards us, be critical of everyone you're listening to about this because no one's the end all be all. You know, we're, we're sitting here, we disagree on things all the time about what something means. Um, sometimes it's, you can, you can have a good idea of what the author is trying to intend, Right. But we can't always know that. And that's something that we kind of have to arrive at collectively and should challenge each other going forward on that. Be hermeneutically suspicious. <laughs> Be suspicious <laughs> hermeneutically of everyone you meet. I am hermeneutically suspicious. I'm going to get that on a shirt. I think you should. That'd be good. I think you should get that on a mug. I will. Get that tattooed on my face. <laughs> I think we're kind of butting up against the end of our time here. But before we go, uh, I want to cover one last section, uh-huh. which is bizarre, what I'm calling bizarre literature. Which I'll keep it brief, but I've just been wanting to talk about this for so long. Okay. What do we have to talk about? Well, have you ever heard about an author named Harry Turtledove? No, he sounds like a Bojack Horseman character. <laughs> he kind of does. <laughs> well, so uh, Mr. Turtledove, our dear, dear friend, Mr. Turtledove, he writes alternate history fiction. Okay, okay. cool. That's M- easy. My main thing There's about... Nothing, nothing crazy there. Sure, nothing ever gets weird in this genre. No. And I read him a lot when I was a teenager, so I do enjoy his books, right? I mean, mm-hmm. he wrote and he has written a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, he has written a concerning number of books about the South winning the Civil War, which hmm. like one sure, he has an original series where the South where what happens is, you know, in real life England also almost joined the Civil War on the side of the South. They had a large trading relationship for Southern cotton. Mm-hmm. So he writes a series where England does do that. He writes it's a trilogy, and he writes about the implications of that. That's super interesting. And he carries it forward to another trilogy where World War One happens, and this time, you know, you know, North and the South are split. So they're super pissed when World War One breaks out, and the South joins their allies, England and France. Well, you know, North America joins Germany in the fight, you know, and that breaks down to a second civil war. Very interesting. You know, Lincoln's still alive, becomes a traveling politician. Uh, Mormons out in Utah become like an insurgent faction who both sides are committing Mm. horrible war crimes against. Really interesting stuff. However, but then you get to his other civil war books, which are like this book called The Guns of the South. And um, just if you hear The Guns of the South, you know it's about the civil war. Can I just ask you, what are you kind of imagining as a storyline here? Um, I would say there is a faction in the South yep. and they have guns. 
Right, yeah. And they use them uh, shooting and whatnot. Yep. Uh, probably in and around the South. Yep, yeah. Which they are from. That basically... With their guns, which they have. Yeah, that basically colors the whole story. I'm just getting one minor little point here, which is that mm-hmm. those guys are Afrikaners mm. from before, right before apartheid ends, who travel back in time to give the Confederacy AK-47s. Um, hmm. And then the Confederacy takes the AK-47s and they win the Civil War with the help okay. of very explicitly, like, even in the book, the Confederates are kind of freaked out by these guys because they're so racist, which is mm-hmm. its own its own thing for Mr. Trilltuff. But um, yeah, so the, the South gets AK-47s or AK-74s realistically. Um, and then you are mostly following this book through the point of view of... Um, general lee and the book ends no joke on his wife dying and then him being you know right after they win the war he's like in this little ball and he sees like a young woman admiring him and he's like i just realized i'm single for the first time in many years which is the weirdest place to end that possible just being like all right so i've got a whole book this confederacy gets ak-47s they make sure slavery stays on also general lee thinks about bonin that's the book it's like come on harry stay focused stay focused <laughs> not your own fantasy <laughs> right. yeah it's that like that would be weird enough but then he also wrote an alt history series where magic is real and the civil war happens and he loosely renames the north and the south but in this version the north actually are the aggressors <laughs> and also the slaves wow. are um white people i mean it's it's not white he people it's light-skinned blonde-haired elves who are the slaves uh-huh. who are enslaved by dark-skinned humans um Uh he's got like it's a real concerning like reading about him personally he seems like he does not actually seem to hold to like confederate beliefs that does not seem to be characteristic of him but he's got a suspicious number of books where the south wins the civil war i mean that's sorry that's not even covered all of them i looked him up and he okay first of all okay i didn't realize he was still alive yeah sorry mr turtle uh that being said he has a phd okay so you can't trust us anymore in byzantine history In Byzantine history, whoops. He looks like Tobias Funke from Arrested Development Cross with George R. R. Martin. <laughs> yeah, that's a good description of him. So. Um, yeah, so that's not even all of his books about the South winning the Civil War. I, that's Those are just some of the wilder ones. He lives in Southern California, though, so you could, I mean, you could. <laughs> I'll travel down to see him. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. You could, I mean, you could feature in his next one. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. He also wrote a book about World War II happening, but aliens invade. Um, And I never read that one, but a friend of mine did. And she tells me that he's got like a weird hard on for baseball. All the heroes are baseball players that like they defeat aliens using their baseball powers somehow. Uh, So a lot going on there. Don't really know how to categorize Mr. Turtle Dove. He's he's written a lot of other stuff, too, about Shakespeare, about like Spain invading uh, England and Shakespeare leading a rebellion against them or God. Yeah, he's he's he has a wide bibliography. This man, dude, this man writes. <laughs> he write he has never stopped writing for even a second in his life. That's this is well, I I feel like I should have been aware. <laughs> right. I mean, the, I, I'm not seriously every time i go to a used bookstore at least one of his books are on the cart outside that are like the one dollar books i am gonna start collecting him in on behalf of you <laughs> my favorite hobby is just like picking them up reading the back and then trying to get my girlfriend to guess what the book is about based on like the first two sentences and she never gets it right which is not a criticism of her because you can just never guess where this is gonna go <laughs> Um, I like that on his Wikipedia page, the bibliography links to its own page. That's how much he's written. They're like, we can't even fit it on the main thing. I know. Yeah, he's like got. He's got so many like twenty book trilogies. It's I mean like really nine Not book only trilogies. That, but... but the pen names. <laughs> right. H N Turtle Tob. They'll never guess that that's actually Harry Turtle Dove. I know. Also, sorry. I just realized. I every time I look at his Wikipedia page, I still discover something new. He's got a whole s- series of stories which are about the state of Jefferson, which is a part of Northern California, Southern Oregon, which is like kind of wants to be a conservative breakaway state. He's got multiple books about or stories about that. That's wild. He just writes things. I, this is what I'm saying. I don't like. I am actually a little envious of how much he can write. <laughs> I mean, honestly, quality aside, it doesn't even matter. To be able to write this many words in a lifetime is an achievement. <laughs> right. Hats off to you, Mr. Turtle Dove. I wish you didn't write some of them, but hats off. Hats off. You you did it. Whether you should have or you not, did you it. did do it. <laughs> you didn't ask that question, but my goodness, did you do it? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um. 
Yeah, I think maybe well, we, we should leave it there. Room. I think for yeah, <laughs> for yeah. The university said the room is up. The our, our room reservations up. They're also out of money, so we have to go. Yeah, three freshmen who are already earning more than we'll ever learn in our lives at their uh, finance internships are telling us we have to get out, or their dads are gonna <laughs> fire us. So that's uh, who runs the university. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we will thank you for listening to office hours and our random ramblings which we are now moving from our episodes to here for the most part you'll hear another one soon enough and um i don't know you have a goodbye for the people matt um you know thanks for coming people don't usually come to office hours so it's nice to see you <laughs> yeah thank you for attending office hours the test will be next week uh all the materials are on canva yeah a big a big thanks to my dog barking in the background big thanks to our current supporters yes and that's my daniel lou gary janice and isaac emily caitlin yitza irini and pack rob and the music used in this episode as it always is is saraya kino by peter Motka. you can find more of their stuff as well as the spelling uh, on bandcamp and youtube and the spellings in the show notes you'll hear from us again soon